Hamlin towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Wester, deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you never spied. But when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the cooks and ladles. Put open the kegs of salted sprat, they nest in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking and shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, think we buy gowns lined with ermine, adults who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find the very civic world keys. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, find the remedy we are lacking, as sure as fate will send you packing. At this, the mayor and corporation quaked with the mighty consternation. An hour they sat in telephone, at length the mayor broke silence, for a gilder eyed my ermine gallon cell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my forehead aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just they said this one should tap at the chamber door when a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation now he sat, looking a little too wondrous back. Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister than a too long opened oyster. Save when at noon his paunch grew mutinous, or a plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on a mat, anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light loose hair and swarthy skin nor tuft of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin. But lips were smile went out and in. There was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great-grandsire, starting up with the trump of doom's tone, had walked this way from his painted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table, and please, your honor, said he, I am able, by means of secret charm to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun, the crawler, swim, or fly, or run after me, so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. And here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat itself, same check. And that scarf's end hung a pipe, and his fingers, they notice, were ever straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as though it dangled over his vesture soul fangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartar and Fred Cam, last June from his huge swarms of gnats. I ease in Asia the nigh them, the monster's brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished Marion corporation. Into the street, Piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe a while. Like a musical adept, blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes of pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, grey rats, tawny rats, grave old potters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the Pied Piper for their lives, from street to street he piped advancing, and step to step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wester, where Noah plunged and perished, save one who stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he the manuscript he cherished, to rat land home his commentary, which was, at first shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as of scraping tripe, 
and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider press's gripe, and a moving away of pickled up boards, and leaving a jar of cods or cupboards, and a drawing quartz of train oil flasks, and breaking into butter casks, and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far, sweeter far than my harp and my soleries breathed, called out, O oh, rats, rejoice, the world has grown to a vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just a bulky sugar punch on, already stayed like a great sun shone. Gracious, scarce an inch before me, just me thought it said, come for me. I found the wester rolling over me. You should have heard the Hamlin people ring the bells, they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, get long poles, poke out the nest and block up the holes, consult with carpenters and builders, leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. Went suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace. The first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders. The bear looked blue, so did the corporation too. For council debtors made wear havoc with Claret and Moselle, bidding the grob hawk. And half the money would replenish their seller's biggest butt of Rhenish. To pay this sum to a wandering fellow, with gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth Mare with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink. What's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink and a matter of money to put in your coat. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, as you well know, was in joke. Besides, the losses of me to thrifty, thousand guilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait inside. I promise a visit by dinner time, Baghdad. And except the crime of the head cook's potage, all of his riching, probably left in the caliph's kitchen, of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver, with you don't think I'll bait a stiver. And folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I broke, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by a ribald, with idle pipes and vesture piebald? Threaten us, fellow, do your worst. Blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe to smooth straight cane, and air he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling, it seemed like a bustling, a very crowd adjusting, a pitching and hustling, small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering, like foals in the farmyard and barley scattering. Out came the children running, all the little boys and girls with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping ran merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting in laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood, as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children merrily skipping by, could only follow with an eye, the joyous crowd at the piper's back, and how the mayor was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosoms beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the wester rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. Power returned from south to west and took up of our hill as steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, great with joy in every breast. He never crossed the mighty top, these forests let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. The piper advanced, and the children followed. And when all were in at the very last, the door in the mountainside shut back. Did I say all? No one was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And in after years, if you would blame his sadness, he was used to say, This doll in our town since my playmates left, I can't forget the time for rap. Of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me, for he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town of Jess at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, flowers put forth a fairer hue, and everything was strange and new. The sparrow was wearing a peacock here, and their dogs are run our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings, and horses were worn with eagles' wings. Just as I became assured, my lame foot be speedily cured. The music stopped, and I stood still found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, there came into many a burgher's pate, a text which says at heaven's gate, hopes of the rich at his easy rate, as the needle of eye takes a camel in. The mayor said east, west, north, and south, to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content, if only he'd return the way he went, and bring the children behind him. 
But when they saw it was lost endeavor, and Piper and dancers were gone forever, they made a decree that lawyers never should take their records dated duly. If after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear, and so long after what happened here on the 22nd of July, 1376, and the better memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they called it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing pipe or caber was sure for his future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostile their tavern, shocked with mirth the street so solemn, and opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote the story on a column, and on their church window painted, the same to make the world acquainted, how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not admit to say, that Transylvania there is a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way in dress, of which their neighbors lay such stress, to their fathers and mothers having risen out of some subterranean prison, into which they were Japan a long time ago in a mighty band, out of Hamlin towns in Brunswick land, but how or why they don't understand. So, Lily, let me and you be wipers, the scores out with all men, especially pipers, and if they should pipe us free from rats from mice, if we promise them aught, let us keep our promise. That was the Pied Piper of Hamlin by Robert Browning. Sorry, I missed your comment. If you want to send your comment again, I'll, I'll read it this time. I was sort of busy there. Oh, hello. 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 Thanks. Welcome to the stream. Today I'm baking at Lonsdale, our Lonsdale location. It's located on uh, Lonsdale on 17th, I think. Uh, I can't see the street sign. It's a little dark out there. There's an SO across the street, city market over there, Starbucks, and this is Rosemary Rocksell right here. This is the original location. This is the oven that I trained on. I've baked in this oven the most of, out of all the ovens that we uh, we have. Yeah, yeah, the 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 the, the cash register is right there, so they or, order right there. Here, I'll, I'll flip the camera around so you can take a look here. Uh, yeah, so that. Uh, yeah, there's some like seating over there. See, you can see the asshole across the street over there. And uh, yeah, I get, yeah, it's not very good view. Sorry. Yeah, this is a this is a small location. Our other locations are larger. Or some of the well, yeah. This is a medium, I guess. No, this would be a considered as a small store. Store, I guess. Not much seating here.
uh, they're mahogany. Uh, it's a hardwood. You need a hardwood because it doesn't, uh, softwoods burn up too quickly. Hardwoods are slow burning, quite durable in the oven. Um, doesn't really impart much flavor. You can smell the boards. <coughs> mm, excuse me. As a baker, you can smell the boards, but you really, it doesn't really impart any flavor in the, in the bagel. I'm, make, I'm baking bagels. We got, I got two batches in the oven right now, and then I have a batch in the pot. I boil them first. I'm making bagels, yes. I think you're a or something. Making the bagels. Making the bagels. Making the bagels. Seeds more seeds. This is my, these are my sesame seeds. Sesame seeds are stored in a bin under the table, if you're wondering. What I was doing down there. I'm gonna tell you a story right now. This one is, uh, so let me just take care of my oven here. Sorry, what, uh, yeah, I only bake the bagels. We have um, we have dough makers making the dough at another location. I'm just gonna flip uh, I'm gonna flip my first batch so they brown on the other side. what I did there, I, I flipped my first batch, they, they're brown on one side and I brown on the other side. Uh, I start, um, I wake up at two o'clock um, and I started at three. I should have started at 2.30 at this location, but um, I had to go pick up the key for it. This is uh, my second day back at this location. didn't have the key so I had to go pick it up from another location that's closer to me. I can tell you a story. This is a story of Roland Pied in the oven blade. There once was a young man named Roland Pye who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder to rest a while from all this baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. 
he put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He would bake until he was tired, then he would pull his recorder out while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland Pied lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of Roland. In the beginning, he said that Roland was a good worker, but lazy. Next, he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he accused Roland of being a sorcerer, and the people turned on him. Therefore, Roland took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners, but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he came and found an old busker and asked, the busker, and asked him for work to keep body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share alms. So Roland Pied and the old man started going around and singing, Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arm. Baker, stand where your feet are. Everybody gave alms to the old man, but to Roland, they said, what is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pye. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages to anyone willing to feed them. So Roland Pye went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms he'd been sharing. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough, then he rolled it into rings. Then he boiled them, dressed them with seeds. Then he baked them until they were golden brown. Then he tossed them in a crate for them to cool down. Whenever Roland wearied of baking, he would play his recorder. And once he was weary of playing his recorder, he would sing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to cream. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old fashioned machine. Baker, lie in the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. Hearing the singing, a princess looked out the window. She saw Roland and fell in love with him. But she was a princess and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night in a boat. When they were already on the high seas, Roland remembered the busker. He said to his beloved, we must fetch the old man, since he gave his alms to me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, we agreed to divide everything we had and I shared everything I own. Now you have the king's daughter and must give half of her to me. At this he gave Roland Clyde a knife to cut his bride in two. 
Roland Pye took the knife with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in two when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop. I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. The old man walked away on the waves. The boat came to an island rich in all good things, with a princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. That was Roland Pied in the oven blade. And that's our first batch. Golden brown. Got two, two batches of sesame in the oven right now. We're gonna get another Another batch in the pot. One, two, three, four. I need to do one more batch of sesame after this. Oh, thank you. It's uh, it's based on an uh, Italian folk tale. I've uh, I've changed some of the names and um, I changed the occupation of the protagonist. In the original, the uh, the, um, the the flute the the flute player the the main character the, I call him Roland Pye, but in the original his name is um, Joseph uh, Ciafolo or something. It's like a, it's a I can't pronounce it very well. It's a Portuguese it's an Italian name that translates to Joseph the Piper or something like that. Um, or yeah, uh, the last name is translates into Italian. Into I think it translates to uh, pipe or flute or something like that. But in the original, the uh, the character is uh, actually a, a pipe or a flute, a tiller, a tiller of a field, like a uh, what you, a farmer, I guess you call it. I don't know, a farm worker. But I changed his occupation to be a, to a uh, baker, so I don't know. I think it, I think it works. It took me about a month to memorize it, and then another month to like practice it enough that it sounded good. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just getting to the point where it feels like the yeah, the words that sort of come automatically. I'm memorizing. Um, I. My repertoire currently is, I have, I've memorized two long poems by Robert Browning. Um, uh, uh, that, that I've, I've memor I'm memorizing another Italian folk tale that I'm modifying to, um, for my own um, desires, whatever, I don't know. 
And um, yeah, so I have two poems, two sh short stories, um, a few long, shorter poems. Yeah, just trying to expand my repertoire, my poetic repertoire. I can, I've re I can recite the first part of um, the Declaration of Independence. I haven't memorized the, uh, all the, the list of infractions or whatever. This is the preambulation. The preambulation to the prosecution. me after this. Man, that's a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, you, uh, I'm going to recite another poem. This is another Robert Browning poem. Uh, it's um, This one is uh, Child Rolling to a Dark Tower Came. Sorry, but Got an itchy face here. Okay, here we go. My first thought was he lied in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye, askings to watch the working of his lie on mine, and most scarce able to afford suppression of the glee that pursed and scored its edge at one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What saved Whaley with his lies and snare? All travelers might find him posted there and ask the road. I guessed what skull-like laugh would break. What crutch can write my epitaph for pastime in the dusty thoroughfare? If at his capsule I should turn aside into ominous track, which all of me hides the dark tower. Yet acquiescingly I turn as he pointed, neither pride nor hope rekindling at the end described, so much as gladness some end might be. For what with my whole worldwide wondering? What with my search drawn out through years? My hope dwindled into a ghost not fit to cope with that obstreperous joy success would bring. I hardly tried now to rebuke the spring my heart made fighting failure in its scope. As a sick man very near to death seems dead indeed, and feels begin and end tears, and takes the farewell of each friend, and hears one bid the other go, draw breath freely outside, since all is over, he saith, and the blow fallen no grieving can amend. While some discuss if near the graves be room enough for this, and when the day suits best for carrying the corpse away, with care about banners, scarfs, and staves, and still the man hears all and only craves, and may not shame such tender love and stay. Thus I had for so long suffered in this quest, heard failure prophesied so oft being rent, so many times among the band to wit. The knights who two dark towers search address their steps, the gist to fail as they seem best, and all doubt was now should I be fit. So quiet as despair I turned from him, that hateful cripple, out of his highway into the path he pointed, all the day had been a dreary one at best, and dim was settling into its close, yet shot one grim red leer to see the plain catch the stray. For Mark, no sooner was I fairly bound, pledged the plain after a pace of you, the pausing from back to the last view, over the safe road twas gone, great plain all round, nothing but plain that the horizon's bound. I must go on, naught else remained to do. So on I went, I think I never saw us at starved ignoble nature, nothing throve, for flowers as well expect a cedar grove, but chortle and spurge according to their law, like propagate their kind with none to awe, you think a burr had been a treasure trove. 
No penry and dirt to sing grimace in some string sore word land's portion. See or close your eyes, said nature peevishly. If nothing skills, I can't help my case. Tis last judgment's fire must cure this place. Calcine's claws and set my prisoners free. If there pushed any ragged thistle stalked above its mates, his head was chopped. The fence were jealous else. What made the holes and rents the dog's harsh forest leave? Bruised as to balk all hope of greenness. Tis a brute was to walk, passing their life out with the brute's intents. As for the grass, it grew as scarce as hair and leprosy. Thin dry blades pricked the mud, which underneath was beaded up with blood. One stiff flying horse, as every bone is stared, stood stupefied however he came there, thrust out past service from the devil's stud. Alive, he might be dead for aught I know, with red, gaunt, and callop neck strain, and shut eyes beneath the rusty mane. Seldom went such grotesqueness with such woe. I never saw a brute I hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart. As a man called for wine before he fights, I asked one draught of earlier, happier sights. Ere fitly I could hope to play the part. Think first, fight afterwards a soldier's art. One taste of old times, that's all to rights. Not it. I fancied Cuthbert's reddening face beneath its garniture of curly gold. Dear fellow, till I almost felt him fold. An arm in mine to fix me to that place. That way he used the last one night's disgrace. I wet my heart's new fire and left it cold. Giles, then, the soul of honor, there he stands. Frank is ten years ago when knighted first. An honest man should dare he said he durst. Good, but the scene shifts. Thaw what hangman's hand pinned to his breast to parchment. His own band reads it, poor traitor spit upon and cursed. Better this present than a past like that, back therefore to my darkening path. No sound of sight as far as the eye can train. Will the night send a howl in our bat, I asked, when something on the dismal flat came to arrest my thoughts and change their train. A sudden little river crossed my path, as unexpected as a serpent came. No tides can jingle through the glooms. Just as it frothed by, it might have been a bat with fiends glowing boots to see the wrath of its black edges back with flakes and spoons. So petty yet so spiteful, all along low scrubby alders kneeled over it. Drenched willows flung them headlong in a fit of rout despair. A suicidal throng, the river which had done them all the wrong, whatever that was, rolled by, deterred no whit. Which while I forded, good saints, how I feared to set my foot upon a dead man's cheek. Each step or feel the spear I thrust to seek, for hollows tangled in his hair or beard. It may have been a water rat I speared, but odd it sounded like a baby shriek. Glad was I to reach other bank, now for a better country, vain presage, who are the strugglers, what war did they wage, who savage trapped could thus pad the dank soil to a plash, toads in a poison tank, or wild cats in a red hot cage. The fight must so have seemed in that foul, sir. We'll pen them there with all the plain to choose. No footsteps leading to that horrid muse. None out of it. Mad ruin set to work their brains, no doubt, like galley slaves a Turk pits for his past by Christians against Jews. And more than that, a furlong on, why there? What bad use was that engine for? That wheel, or great not wheel, that hair open to reel men's bodies out like silk with all the air of Tophet's tool, on earth left unaware or brought to sharpen its rusty teeth of steel. Then came some, then came some stump ground, once a wood, next to marsh of the sea, down mere earth, desperate and done with soul the fool finds mirth, makes a thing and mars it, till his mood changes, and off he goes, within a rude ball clay and marsh, sand and stark black dirt. Now blotches rankling color gay and grim, now patches where some leanness of the soils broke with moss or some things like boils. Then came a palsied oak, a cleft in him, a distorted mouth that splits its rim, gaping at death and dies while it recoils. And as far as ever from the end, not in the distance but the evening not, to point my footsteps further at the thought, great black bird Apollyon's bosom's friend, sailed past or beat his wide wings dragon pen that brushed my cap perchance the guide I sought. For looking up aware I somehow grew, the plain had given place all round the mountains with such names and gray spear heights and heaps now stolen in view. How thus they surprised me, saw the you, how to get from there was no clear case. 
Yet half I seem to recognize some trick of mischief it happened to me. God knows when, in a bad dream perhaps, here ended in progress this way, when in the very nick of giving up one more time came a click as when the trap shuts you're in the den. Burning when they came upon me all at once, this was the place. Those two hills crouched like two bulls locked horn in horn in fight, while to the left tall scout mountain, Dunce daughter to dozing at the very nuns after a lifetime of training for the sight. What in the midst lay but the tower itself, the round squat turret, blind as a jewel's heart, built of round stone without a counterpart in the whole world. The tempest mocking out points of the ship and thus the unseen shelf he strikes on only when timbers start. Not see, because of night perhaps, why day came back for that. Behind it left the dying sunset, kindled through a cleft, the hills like two giants in the hunting lay, chin upon hand to see the game at bay, now stab and end the creature to the heft. Not here, when noise was everywhere, it told, increasing like a bell, names in my ears, of lost adventurers my peers, how such was strong and such was bold, and such was fortunate, yet each of old, lost, lost, one moment now the woe of years. There they stood, ranged along the hillside met, the view the last of me, a living frame, for one more picture in a sheet of flame. I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless a slug one through my lips, I sat in blue, tiled roll into a dark tower came. Now this child rolled into a dark tower came. Um, it's about uh, <clears throat> it's about a young knight who's on a quest through a barren, desolate, broken, horrible, tortured land, and he's being lied to all the way on, on his entire journey. He's being lied to by somebody he's told to follow and he goes through all these little he has a he, has a, he sees a dying horse and um, he has to wait he has to ford through a river and there's like a horrible landscape and torture beings everywhere yeah it's just about it's just about a, a, a it's about a life quest. It's about going on a journey and suffering in order to reach your destination. It's sort of like the Lord of the Rings. Child Roland is just like Frodo. He has to get the one ring to this dark and horrible place. He has to take it there and destroy it. Child Roland has to do the same thing. Hmm. <coughs> Child Roland goes to the, the land of Mordor. On a quest led by a deceitful, um, corrupt human, uh, you know, what is his name? Gollum. He's that, that corrupt, that corrupted, um, deceitful uh, creature. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah, so Roll, Child Roland is just like Frodo. And, uh, but there's two personifications in uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's version. 
There's Gandalf. He's he's uh, he's the, the the wizard that that is the wise wizard that guides Frodo. And then Gollum is sort of the the opposite. He leads he leads um, Frodo through deceit, whereas Gandalf leads Frodo through persuasion. Surprised if J.R. Tolkien had, had read. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if J.R. Tolkien had read Robert Browning because um, I mean, J.R. Tolkien's a lot more Victorian than I am, and I'm re I'm reading that dude, man. I love I love Victorians. J.R. Tolkien was a he. Uh, I think he really admired the Victorian. Victorian writers. I really admire Victorian writers. Victorian writers, are, that's one of the greatest generation of writers that's ever existed. In my opinion, I love Victorians. I like. Uh, I'm sure there were some bad books written in that era, but they're hard to find nowadays. <coughs> so I'm getting over a cold. Mm. Got a bit of a dry throat. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, a lot of people contrast the characters between, you know, Gandalf and Saruman. But I think that the real contrast is between Gandalf and Gollum, because um, those those are the two characters that lead Frodo to where he needs to go. Gandalf gets Frodo on the path to go to the to deliver the ring, and Gollum takes him the rest of the way through Morador. And but um, Frodo needed both of them. He needed. He needed to be led by the person that had the wise old man Gandalf, but he also needs to be led by the deceitful one too. And I think that's that's a big that's a big lesson to be learned from the Lord of the Rings and and Robert Browning is that suffering is part of the is part of the quest. It's an unavoidable part of the quest. It is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an essential part of the quest, almost. The moment we stop suffering is the day that we become Edenic creatures, like in the Bible. But we know, we know, we know good and evil. We acknowledge a good and evil. We know what causes suffering. Yeah. I think, I think that's the, well, that's a crucial message of, uh, Lord of the Rings is that suffering is part of the, the quest and the way to deal with that suffering is to educate yourself, make friends, travel, learn, do That that's that's the big that's a big lesson that Bilbo learns, right? Bilbo in the Hobbit learns that you have to you have to go on an adventure in order to to grow. <clears throat> um, 
And for him, it's to become a writer, right? Bilbo, Bilbo uh, aspires to become a writer after he, he does all that traveling. And uh, I think that's what J.R. Tolkien was saying too, is like writers like J.R.R. Tolkien was, they needed, they, you need to have life experience in order to, in order to write. And J.R.R. Tolkien had a lot of real life experience. I mean, he 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 fought in. Uh, I think he fought in World War One. I. I mean, you can't have that. You can't experience anything more terrifying and horrible than as something like out of World War One. Was this a brutal war? Like one of the worst you can imagine it's all that it's the first war where all those modern weapons come into are deployed on the on the, the uh, battlefield you know chemical weapons machine it's the first war and it's mach the machine gun is um, crude like plays a crucial role I think, uh, I think ta tanks were developed during the First World War. So just think of J.R. Tolkien's actual life. Yeah, I really hope we don't see a war, a world war, in. Uh, my lifetime, that's for sure. The next world the next world war is gonna be pretty bad. If there is one. Which looks increasingly impossible with the way Trump is, okay? We got two batches in the crate. I'm gonna take my third batch out pretty soon. Give me a minute. Yeah. Well, I just hope we can avoid it. It's preventable. World wars are preventable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna have to. The, ne the next, the next world war is gonna be between probably U.S. and Russia or U.S. and China. And uh, they have a lot of, yeah, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it's not going to be, it's not going to look good. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully our politicians can avoid it, but who knows. They're not doing much about climate change, so I'm not, I'm not very hopeful that they can do much about anything really. So.
Yeah. Yeah, it's a dangerous combination. Yeah, we're still we still behave like our prehistoric ancestors, but now we have nuclear weapons. <coughs> it's, it's terrible. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Our, our prehistoric ancestors probably behaved a lot better than we do now. That's what we need. we need. We need politicians to respect laws again. We, just, we, have, we have these politicians with too much power and impunity. Like Putin and maybe Trump. Hopefully Trump doesn't get away with his corruption. He's obviously... He's obviously a bad faith actor. Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, I missed that one. Were you saying? <laughs> Excuse me. Hopefully, America might not be on the right track, but I think most of the rest of the world is. Yeah. Funny, I almost trust China more than I trust you did the Americans now. Trump and like Which is ironic. Considering China's an authoritarian state. 
The heart asks beauty first, and then excuse from pain, and then those little anodynes that deaden suffering, and then to go to sleep, and then if it should be the will of its inquisitor, the liberty to die. That was some Emily Dickinson. Uh, yeah, yeah, you should check out Emily Dickinson for sure. She's awesome. She's a great Victorian, she's another Victorian poet. Those Victorians, man, they wrote some good books. Some good poems. I, got, I can't think of a bad Victorian writer. I love them all. I'm sure there's some bad Virginia Woolf, she was another good, she's an excellent writer. A Room of One's Own, one of the greatest essays ever written. Yeah, check out, check her out. Ah, um, A Room of One's Own is a really good read. I really enjoy it. I was thinking about memorizing it because it's all very long. So many things I want to memorize. Not enough time to do it. it. Takes me quite a while to memorize something. But once I have it memorized, it sticks with me for a long time. Beauty of woman and a wise heart's words, and men in our arms and their nobility. The colloquies of love, the songs of birds, and hands of ships on the fast running sea. The calmness of air as daybreak looms, and white snow falling on a windless day. A flowing brook, a meadow full of blooms. Silver and gold and lapis in array. Yeah, I know. Yeah, th things long past over suffice and men forgotten that were. Things long past over suffice and men forgotten that were. Things in the past are things that we need now. Things that our ancestors did were very important things. We should not forget what they did, what they do, how they did it. Things long past over suffice and men forgotten that word. Got some everything bagels. Wow, these are really puffy bagels. A little too puffy. Too puffy for their own good. Oh, thank you. Thanks for watching.
I, uh, I try to be as regular as possible, so, I don't know. I haven't had very many viewers lately, so I haven't been doing it very much lately. So, yeah, thanks for watching. I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm a little bit repetitive, so people watch me once and they don't have to watch me ever again, so I need to expand my repertoire, which I'm working on, so. Have an excellent morning. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks for watching.